Welcome to Feed the Trolls. It's been two weeks. We haven't been around. Thorin was gallivanting, doing desk work again. Uh, very cool to see you on uh, Elisa Masters. Also, I laughed so hard at the highlights. Good job, Thorin. Um, All right. It was a good time, and I was moving a house, so I just had no internet connectivity. And Ted is joining us. Ted, you were pretty much working every single event I turned on in the last two weeks. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's been an eventful couple of weeks. I, I still am working some of the events that you probably turned on. Yeah, it's uh, the only the only reason I think it was a shame, by the way, is because you mentioned Duncan worked the the masters in Espo, right? Because I was working another event during that time. I was working the RS, right. and I couldn't I couldn't watch live. But I just want to jump in and say I watched the highlights. That was that was one of the most hilarious things I've ever seen. Nice. <laughs> Especially the one with the uh, with the I, I I did bring all my fans into the arena today. Sure. That, that, <laughs> that, that, good. that yeah. was great. That was great. <laughs> Basically, if you don't know, guys, any time there's a CS match you didn't watch in tier two, then Ted did the I analysis and yeah. Neil Kai probably was there as well. Like they just they just do every game apparently. You it's know the... why it's funny? Because we worked together literally right. today. Okay. <laughs> You work together today. He's got to get on a flight tomorrow. This is the thing. It's the tier two grind, right? You're just constantly yes. doing events after event. And it kind of ties in nicely with what we want to talk about tonight, which is the tough times of, of tier two and, and what's been going on online. Uh, we, we're going to talk a bit about the bleed fiasco. I want to touch on the sore shit show. I mean, that's the mm. only way I can describe it. But I want to start by talking specifically about something that I think is just going to make this even worse, which is the change that we're going to see in 2025, where pretty much every tournament, every important tournament is going to come down to Valve rankings. And in a way, I feel like what that means is if you are in Tier 2, you're going to have a, a hope and hull of, of getting into some of these bigger events, especially with the RMRs going away. I mean, Ted, you commented so much of these events what did you think when you saw this shift and this change where pretty much every big event's going to be reliant on Valve rankings? I mean, from from the perspective of a caster, obviously, it, it kind of looks like it's a two-edged sword, right? Because you get a lot more work, but then in the same time, burnout is going to be a lot more severe. If you're talking about players, though, I'm not sure I'm a big fan of it. I mean, you are getting a lot more opportunities. And the good part is that, let's say, we're going to avoid th that moment for, for example, going back in time when EG were still a partner team and they were absolutely terrible, but they were still getting invited for every single event. We're going to avoid that part of it, right? Because the majority of the teams that they're playing are going to be good and, and they're going to be informed. In the same time, the one thing I don't like, even though it's supposed to be an open circuit, for a lot of the teams, you're not going to be able to get that one-off where you have a really good event, you qualify for something massive, and then from that point, you start snowball into something bigger, right? Every single, and it, it's a bit of an awkward one because on one point, it feels like if you get a, a tier two team to start playing tier one Counter-Strike, they would, they would have deserved it more, right? Because they would have had to win more, play a lot more games and stuff like that. But then in the same time, I feel like it probably takes away a little bit of the Cinderella effect where one team is just going to have a sick run through an open and close qualifier and then qualify for a tier one event and just go out and play. What do you think about it, Thorin? I mean, when you see how it's kind of adjusted and changed and everything's reliant on basically getting as many of these big tournaments under your belt as possible. I will say, if people are unfamiliar with some of the more specifics and the nuance of this topic, there's actually two episodes you can watch. There's one is Feed the Trolls, the one we did with Messi also. And then similarly, Messi also was actually the guest on an episode of The Four Horsemen on Last Free Nation, where we also talked about like the upcoming circuit and the problems in CS, etc. And the reason why I highlight that is because I actually think most of these topics are like super complicated. They're not as mm. simple as the big headline. In fact, actually, that's part of the problem, like as Ted alludes to. If you hear the big headline, well, partner slots are going away. Everyone just rejoices, like, yeah! brilliant like i as he says i hated when it was like when mibr had that whack one for years and then evil genius yeah. has had one and some of the og had one but you know you wouldn't have like ents who was like a top three team of the world didn't have a spot so that might sound good as the big headline but you want as always as we say in english the devil is in the details and unfortunately a lot of that stuff is really complicated so the reason i refer to those messy also um episodes is he's someone who's basically been in almost every position in the industry he's worked for the tos including the sl blast and he's worked 
worked as an admin and then he's been on the team side as well. So, and I think he maybe even done like agent stuff and he was a journalist once upon a time. So he actually has a, quite a big, like broad picture of it and he can tell you the details because as far as I understood from talking to him, two of the problems, like I'll tell you to two there is, right? The big picture looks again, universally great. It just sounds like it, what we all want, right? We want a massive open circuit with a million events. Crucially, we don't want one TO like ESL to just control the circuit. We want it kind of like split among all the big TOs. And so it just sounds like, well, you know, the more the merrier, what's wrong, right? More tournaments, more prize money, better, right? It's an open circuit, but here's the problem. What you're thinking of as being awesome about the open circuit, it seems like currently, whether it's a feature or a bug, is actually not what you're going to get next year. Like, you're going to have all these giant tournaments, it's true. By the way, PGL ones are going to be like a million dollars each tournament, so all the top teams are going to try and go to those tournaments, but that's actually where I think there's a flaw in what we want the circuit to be, because most people, I think, wanted these changes to help the smaller teams in as far as I can tell, like a lot of like, let's just say this is the equivalent of like government regulation. It, it might be called like the help the little guy act, but this is really just to fuck the little guy and give the rich guy even more of a tax break in this analogy. Because basically the problem is, if you think about what we all used to love about the old circuit before the online period, was that there were so many tournaments you could hustle, you could actually go and you could use that as your path to get to the top. In fact, you could even argue it incentivized even top teams to hustle, because I'll give you an example. If you were a team like a Complexity or maybe a Mongols or, I mean, I don't know where Ents is now, but let's say they enter the top 20, you know, if you were these sorts of teams, even if you yourself are already throughout top 10, you're probably not going to win IEM Rio if you go to it. You go to that event to test how good you are, get like a top place. So, but what you could do in the meantime is, after after that, you could just look on the circuit and go, right, well, all those teams that would beat me at I Am Rio, they're not going to this like medium-sized land in two weeks. So I'll go there. I'll be the favorite at that event. I'll pick up the easy little, you know, 25, 50K. I'll get these ranking points and I'll use that as my way. If you don't know, it's basically how tennis works. As you're on the way up, you go to the smaller tennis tournaments to win them, to get your points and build them up. You're not going to win the Masters tournament around the gate or a Grand Slam. The downside here is basically this. As far as I can tell, that won't exist in the circuit. Every top team will just all attempt to attend the same 10 to 15 lands over the year. And then the worst part is, if you actually are the little guy who breaks through briefly, so we've got a brilliant example recently, which is actually Saw making top four IM Cologne. That example in my re re example I gave you before, what like 2019 CS was like, the second you get that top four if you're Saw, you actually accept every invite you can get after that. You go, oh, have you got like a challenger event? Have you got a dream? Yeah. Up? Give me them all because I'll tell you what, first of all, I'm probably not going to get another massive top Fun. So almost let me like parlay the fact I've got this like status to get into all these events and pick up some small cash and test myself. Whereas actually, as far as I can tell in the next circuit, actually that team would be incentivized not to play any tournaments after that. They should wait and use that one like little lottery ticket they got for my cologne and wait and hope they get like the Rio one, for example. And then just wait, don't do anything because if you go to these smaller tournaments, you can lose ELO position, you can lose ranking points. You wait and then you just gamble that again. You can parlay that into the real one. So unfortunately, as far as I can tell, People are welcome to tell me this is not the way it works. As far as I can tell, it actually goes the opposite of what most people want. People think it's going to help the saws and the little guys in the world. But as far as I can tell, this is why this, uh, this episode is going to be very relevant. Actually, it's going to probably make life harder for some of those people. And then if you go and look, it's still not going to be like the same as what the party system was. It was essentially, by the way, like free money for the top teams if they had the slot. But they are going to, in the end, I think they're going to make their money anyway because they're getting to all the big lands. So I actually think there's so much you can unpack it, so many angles we can go in because I could see a lot of that pretty sweet without speaking outside of school, because I can't say what they're going to do. I would be surprised, for example, if that same event I just did at Lisa Masters is on next year with the same level of teams. Remember, they had like the number 11, number 13 teams there. Yeah. And quite frankly, talent like famous people. So I would imagine it will be a smaller regional finish event again, if I had to guess, because that's the world we're about to go into, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Simon, you can go on. No, no, no. You jump on in, Ted, and okay. then I'll, I'll add my uh, bit at the end. The, the crazy part is I feel like this is one of those things where a massive update being brought in, and, and then everyone is going to talk about it. Everyone's going to theorize. But in the end of the day, we're not going to know what the downside of it is up until, let's say, six months into sure. it or a couple months yes. into it. Because this is like the best, play the best people to give feedback on that stuff are usually players, right? When you open Twitter and you see that, let's say, of 80% of the tier two, tier three community is saying that even when they win games, they just can't get into the tier one scene. This sure. is when you know is dysfunctional, right? Because now, as you pointed out, the, the devil really is in the detail because there's no one that can just come out and say, okay, this is how every single thing in the circuit is going to go and every single rule is going to be, every single event is going to go. So in the end of the day, I, I completely agree with you. And I feel like this is the downside 
for me and I'm, I'm not sure how sustainable that entire open circuit thing is going to be and for how many years it can go even from a financial point of view but for a lot of the teams I feel like Counter-Strike, in, in general, the Tier 2 Counter-Strike scene is incredibly blessed when you compare it to a lot of other scenes, when you're looking at other esports. And I think this open circuit is actually... I mean, th there is a possibility that it makes it even better for some in, in the scene, but there is a possibility that it actually just buries a lot of the Tier 2, Tier 3 guys and tells them, you know what, you can't qualify for an event. And if you by any chance qualify and make a deep run, as you gave a really good example with so, then you're not going to be able to farm and play those lower tier events again and you're going to be forced to just go into the tier one events and just get completely battered by all the top dogs because you had that cinderella story once but then you can't go back and work on your flaws in tier two and grind a little bit of uh of confidence win a couple of games that should be a little bit easier for you get a little bit of prize money you're going to be forced to play tier one tier one tier one and we know like so if they were forced to have after for example cologne to play every single tier one event until the end of the year they probably wouldn't have been able to get out oh, of the a second, a second yeah, time of it's i haven't done enough research into this so i might be i, I might stand to be crazy i don't think but... anyone has to don't yeah. that. we're all speculating here. <laughs> my understanding is obviously it's going to be invites for if you want to get into the big tournaments the, the concept that we had before the cinderella story where a saw can qualify isn't going to happen because it's going to be invites yes. only so basically all the top teams the the top dogs will constantly be invited and saw will never be able to qualify so the cinderella story falls away which then just makes tier two even more troublesome and it, it's the conversation we were going to have today it's the same stuff that comes up time and time again and we'll talk about saw we can talk about bleed now though and the fact that it's obviously come out these guys haven't been paid there's this ceo and this organization that's basically just conned this entire team it's a story that we see happen all the time i think there was that other indian organization that did it surely this new system uh, creates even more of an opportunity for this to happen because you're just going to have these desperate players trying to to find a way to break into tier one and i mean ted i think it's a good transition into the the bleed story did you see this coming because i've spoken to a couple of commentators in tier two who tell me that they all kind of figured it would happen with bleed purely because of the individuals involved and the fact that it turns out they actually owed a bunch of commentators money for for months or years on end as well did, did you kind of think that there was something dodgy happening with that organization I want to say, uh, first of all, I'm not one of the casters that was old money by them. So I, I had no idea about that aspect of it. Uh, I will say for my part, because obviously I, uh, I was following Bleed a lot, especially at the start. It was really exciting for me from a personal point of view when they had Cirque and Vladon on, because I, I think both of them are really underrated. Even I, I don't, I'm not going to jump on the, on the Cirque train, obviously a little bit of Bulgarian bias here, but <laughs> just, a uh, just, yeah, a just a tad bit, but, uh, I, I think I think I actually ha wasn't asking around bleed. It wasn't crossing my mind because I I feel like I, I knew that there was something that was a little bit awkward when they would just go when when Kasai would just go and, and, and do go for all of the transactions that he wanted to instantly, which I thought from in my mind was he was making good decisions. But in my mind was like this organization is just doing and backing every single thing that he wants to do. So I was right. like, that actually sounds really good from the outside, but it almost sounds a little bit too good to be true, right? He, he hasn't gone a single time and said, you know what, I wanted to do this, but the organization told me we can't financially justify it. So I was like, okay, there's, there's two chances. Either there's something bad happening there, or this organization is just sick, and they want to support fully, and they believe in Kassad fully. And I, I, I want to say for me, I'm not going to pretend I knew. I didn't know what was going on. I wasn't asking around too much. I didn't, I didn't feel like it was dodgy, because I, I feel like it was one of those teams that I, I, I just believed that with Kassad being involved, with the general manager, uh, you know, the, uh, the Serbian guy, Bax, who, who used to be the owner of Four Glory. So I just believe that those guys would get involved with, with a really legitimate thing. And I was like, okay, they're associated with it. I believe everything's going to be all right. So yeah, I got really surprised, actually, when I saw that all of it was uh, happening. And I actually had a bit of a talk with, with Cirque as well about it. And he was like, I didn't even know I was on that much, um, that much money from the organization. He, he had forgotten about it so yeah it was just a it was just a really awkward situation i guess and you could it, you could tell as well because uh at the rest champions that i was in belgrade literally last week obviously it was alan and they were there you could just tell that the energy in the team was incredibly awkward but now that you now that we know what happened on an organizational level i feel like that could justify when we start talking about the more 
in-game aspect of what was happening with Bleed and with Unpaid recently. I think you can you can justify a lot of the a lot of the results and a lot of the bad individual form from some players and just odd things that were happening to the team. You can align them, let's say, and connect them to what was happening behind the curtain, so to speak. Thorn, why does this keep happening though? Because this isn't the first time. It won't be the last time. I think it'll be even worse next year. Why does it keep happening? I can give you an abstract one, actually. This is my specialty, which goes like this. I once actually did a video along these lines on my YouTube channel. It's just like a general thoughts type video where basically the premise I explained was, I think the title was even something like there will always be shady organizations in esports. And what I explained was this actually isn't an esports specific problem, although certainly we can find like idiosyncratic elements that will relate to bleed and esports. And what I'll say is I'll say it's any kind of entertainment industry because what you have in every entertainment industry is those are the jobs everyone dreams of. They're aspirational so you'll always have a larger supply of young naive people who desperately want to get into that field and have this like amazing job of fame and celebrity and power and money and the chance to be the best at something and because people are so desperate what you will always get essentially is right it means that the, that will always exceed the demand of how many people there are that can do the job. And so unfortunately, what will happen is it's quite logical. The really legit people in the space will get signed to the really legit organizations of the big ones. And then the people who are just desperate to make it haven't made it yet and are still on the way up or maybe even had like, you know, problems in their career or they're from like a region that isn't massive in the game and there's not the same opportunities. They will just end up inevitably accepting dodgy sponsorships, dodgy owners, dodgy jobs, by the way. I mean, there's plenty of cast. It's same for casting and so i would say if you think about it, right it's the exact same as like hollywood and it and all the people over there who are like waiting tables and desperately trying to become an actor or the music industry where you hear these crazy stories where even some of the biggest artists in the world if they shot up in the first like two years sometimes the first few years they're barely making any money and the contract they're on is like one of those really dodgy ones it's quite an obvious logical reason why which is one when you have something super legit actually people who are scammers will look and go if i can pretend to be like the legit people i can get in the way of you the person who provides a talent or a service and the money basically and i can maybe nick some of that for myself and then the other aspect is when you haven't made it yet and you're a nobody and you're desperate because you're going to be willing to take any chance there's also unfortunately it's quite a, a dark it's kind of a blast black pill but if you think about it who is going to take a chance on you when you are a nobody and you haven't made it the person who themselves is getting such an upside from taking that chance that it's worth it for them so unfortunately what's going to happen is if you think of like this is classically how it works like a lot of actors and music people I've heard the lowest level agent guy really he's almost just taking like a lottery chance on a million people he's taking like this guy this guy this guy and look when the job comes in this might sound familiar for how certain talent agencies might work Sam when the job comes in and he's got like three spots for something he's going to give it to his best person who's his biggest earner and you know a couple of other people he thinks could be there he's not going to give it to the person at the end of the table as it were my joke there would be in esports if a talent agency comes on and they represent 20 people if an awesome casting gig comes in they're not going to the new guy are they he's going to get the worst thing at the very end of an online cop that might be dodgy and the joke is the really the really good one if you know the industry is some of these agencies the people who run the agency themselves are talent so if you've ever seen ted might know this ricky gervais once did a little series on uk tv but it was called like life's too short with this legendary actually like dwarf actor called warwick davis right and the gag okay. was he himself ran like a talent agency for dwarves but you can imagine ted that meant any good gig came in he was basically just sort of yeah put me in it then but he was supposed to be looking out for all the other dwarf people who work with him. but obviously anything good went to him so basically that is how as far as i can tell these agencies work at the lowest level because it's basically when you your first gig as far as i can tell when you're nobody they're going to be taking a chance on you like this and so i yeah. think this relates perfectly to actually esports because if you think about it right in the case of Kassad, he actually did some quite shrewd like gming and got players we do know but most yeah. of the time in tier two these are people who haven't yet made it yet they haven't been on a big team you haven't even been to the big lands yet so unfortunately i do think unless you have someone who has incredible eye for talent which you will obviously get in agencies in every field someone who actually can find the people the people who aren't doing that are just using the upside that basically if you don't make it they don't really care and if you do then they're going to bleed funnily enough they're going to bleed you dry they're going to get the craziest margin they possibly can and sometimes in certain cases look you don't i would say the bleed one's a bit extreme because it seems like they're just not going to get any of the money the guys absolutely run away i would say it's more like people just doing predatory contracts or okay. their their share is you know disproportionate because they've got you on the hook etc and you would be known without them so i do think that's that's part of it basically it's like whenever you get an industry like that 
because you're on the fringe as someone who hasn't made it yet, unfortunately, the kind of person you're going to meet isn't going to be a reputable person because they've already got a, a million people lining up at the door who want to work, in this case, to play for them in esports. It could be to be a singer or a musician in music or to be an mm-hmm. actor. Obviously, we can all understand how I, unfortunately, even if you tell people, watch out for dodgy people, they want to make it more than they care about if there might be a chance this guy's dodgy, I'm afraid. Do you know what blows my mind about this whole thing, though, is that they got Cassad to be their coach. Sure. I was like, let's take the most sort of outspoken, loud, sure. freaking doesn't <laughs> shut up person, and let's put him in charge because – because that makes complete sense. Like that, that for me was the weirdest one. Cause I was like, out of all the people, if, if you know, and I'm pretty sure at this point that this company kind of knew that, that they weren't a hundred percent legit. Like I would, this is not the guy I would have got. Cause he sure. is so loud and he doesn't give a shit if he, if he burns every bridge. That would surprise me. What also surprised me is obviously Kassad himself announcing that he basically was funding this team for months on end. And I can't understand why he would do that because the Kassad, I mean, I'd have to ask him at some point, but the Kassad I know would have would have just been like, you know, F this. And yet, here he was, Ted, like financing the boot camps, making sure, I think he was paying for two players' apartments, like yeah. trying to keep this thing afloat. Good faith? D- did he honestly believe that this organization was going to pull through eventually? I think at one point it must have been, first of all, by the way, I I really respected the fact that he was willing to pay for all of that. When I saw it, I didn't initially believe, but he he looks like the type of a guy that would probably do it. I think it might be, I think it might be kind of like, I don't want to go down with the ship because I've invested a lot and I don't want to go out and say that I've had poor judgment for the organization type of thing. Or, I mean, we don't know what the conversations were like between him and, and, and the orc as well, right? Because from from our perspective, it looks obvious. Like, they make you pay for stuff. You just tell them, okay, this is unprofessional. This is not how it's done. Uh, let's all leave. But maybe they were good in communicating and just giving him excuses all of the time, being like, hey, that's the reason you're not getting the money. Hey, that's the reason we're not getting the money, given a lot of false promises. I feel like this is probably the only justifiable reason for all of that to happen. And for me, I just I just feel like with, with Kassad, at least through my lens, he's always been that type of a guy that as a coach looks like a bit more of a father figure, I guess you could say. So I think a, a bit of it might have been him not wanting to let down the players after, let's say, he's gone to Jacob and, and told him, hey, uh, come in alongside Nog this project is going to be great. We're going to make it work and stuff like that because they knew each other from back in the day, right? Working with Renegades and they've always been in good relationships. So I think it was probably him trying to hold on to it and trying to fix things from the inside, maybe because of the players. Because I think if it was just him and if if he didn't care for the players, he probably would have left. I think this is more of Kassad trying to make it work for the entire team and look after everyone. And I mean, it's, it's really easy to go to that deduction. I feel like when you... Again, remember the fact that he he used to pay for some of the players for for some expenses and stuff like that. This is not a coach that is trying to save his own work or the, I I don't know, whatever, actually. Not not even his own salary because he was getting them, right? This is a coach that is trying to back the players and take care of the players that he himself convinced that it's a good idea to come into the organization. So I feel like it's kind of like him taking a lot of responsibility, even though I don't think he's in a position where he can really well he where he needs to take responsibility for that because it's not his fault that the organization decided to be a scammer's or right but in the end of the day i think he did the manly thing so to speak and uh yeah i mean it, it it's a bit of a shame but in the same time i think it's it, it's respectful it's deserving of some respect because basically destroyed his own internet persona by letting us know that he was taking care of everyone thorn it's the truth <laughs> the real Kassad is soft and squishy and a kind, caring human. And he didn't want anyone to know. Sorry, Kassad. I mean, I will say, even though I agree, by the way, like, there's, I agree with Ted that he has zero obligation to do any of this. In fact, I would even say, I'd go the other way and say, mate, like, unless you read, I, I get you like friends with Nexa and some of these people like Jacob was in his old Renegades team, so he probably has a bigger connection than just any random player. But I would even tell him, like, bro, what are you fucking front of the costs for? Like, you're going to end up carrying the bag in that scenario. You, by the way, you probably should leave if you find out. But I actually think, in a sense, that all 
also shows that Kazad is like a true believer because I also think a part of it might have been naivety on his end. So I'll give you the angle I think, which is this. It's one thing if an org owes one player some money, right? Sometimes that might never get paid because if they pay everyone else in the org or that's just the late payment, etc. It's really easy for that to fall between the cracks. And by the way, players are really bad at getting that out there with media or doing court cases. So I think if you're Kassad, what you're sort of gambling on, I think when you end up footing the bill yourself or paying things or forwarding money, is you're thinking, well, essentially, which by the way, think of what, what has happened is actually the least likely outcome. The, le- the more likely outcome was someone's fucking up inside or someone lied about how much money you had or you or maybe a classic one is you waiting for a sponsor to pay or an event to pay and the money really just didn't come yet and people are just being like, too cowardly to tell you basically like sorry it's going to be another month and they're just avoiding your email so in that scenario as long as basically it isn't what it is now which is it seems like the actual owner guy's gone to see your guy and there's no money and you're probably never going to get paid as long as it's not that then actually if you're Kassad and you take on some of the sort of like onto your shoulders what's going on then in theory eventually it is going to get paid because you're like a vital part of the org and the difference is they can't just fob you off eventually they're going to have to come to you and you want to sign more players or you eventually have a certain amount of months it's going to become really unhinged isn't it unfortunately for him it's seems like that gamble has failed and absolutely there was just the whole log was nonsense which I will say is really hard I would imagine even from internally to figure out because there's two factors here one is supposedly when I remember hearing about bleed actually more from the Valorant side when they were trying to sign some big name players there yeah. and first of all in that game I can tell you they went the opposite route to what Kassad did in CS they didn't come with like we're going to sign like you know like formerly great players but on the cheap now and try and see they were doing the opposite if you remember Ted they were trying to say stuff like we want like the best players in the world yeah. When that CNED guy won champions, they yeah. wanted him. And then they, they wanted Ye, obviously, when he was like the player of the year in like 2020. They were going for the biggest names, and if anything, mm. like to get the most attention. And then if, if anyone looks this up, at the end of 2021, it was claimed that they had a $50 million investment from a venture capital company. So if that was all true, and you look at like the way they were trying to splash around, people just thought it's like a massive new player in the industry. I will say that immediately is the red flag, unfortunately, because the difference is certainly any org could go bust and disappear but you know what I might give Astralis a lot of shit but I don't really think we're going to wake up tomorrow and find out like Astralis didn't pay for you for six months and then they're just going to sneak off no. out the back door and never hear from like Nicole and I am again like that's actually one thing no matter what you might think about the guy you can imagine he's going to be around a few more years and sort of there will be like an appropriate way he departs the industry probably not with a massive bag with a dollar sign on it running out with some stripy clothing on well we hope that was mad <laughs> fantasy would be that he does of course and then I'm obviously it signed as the one man to go and hunt him down tell him really what he can <laughs> Get him on the he's on the street. That's not fair. And yeah, no. But anyway, the, obviously I'd say you'd get. Obviously, then the joke is then out comes Bro with a cast on his arm. He, oh, he's not. He's not behind there, Thorin. Oh, hell. Anyway, just to, I have to pull Katie in as my cop. But buddy, then no. But anyway, the point is, unfortunately, that part is actually quite disturbing because I do actually get the feeling that like you couldn't really guess this was going to happen. Because as I say, basically, what Kaxan was gambling was as long as the entire org isn't going tits up, and as long as one day there will be money again, it'll all be okay. It turns out, unfortunately, yeah. that is not the case. And I do think as well, I know people are giving him his props but like I, I think he should get like giga props to do this because as far as I can tell it's like you say he really just seems to have actually done this like just for the sake of the players even even though by the way he should, remember guys he's just had a kid actually he's, he should have to care about his own family situation mm. his own income so I, I, I hope this doesn't continue on much longer but props to him for doing what he could I think it's a very I'd say a very respectable position to yeah, they even took some of the money that they won from the RES yes. as well to give it to the manager and the yes. and the analyst, right? It was Kassad and, and Cypher. I think the craziest thing as well is just I'm going to add one little thing. I think uh, I, I read somewhere that actually the owner of Bleed was the son of an ex-owner of the football club Valencia. In it's Spain. supposedly really rich, right? By the way, yeah. I will say that itself is a red flag, though, which is this. There's a big right. difference in life, Ted, between someone who's rich, as in they the, made the a bunch son of, money, of the rich and guy. the son exactly. of the guy who yeah. has that money. Because unfortunately, if you were to ask, like, because what that means, by the way, this is a mad one people might not get. That means the guy might even have the money. He might just be irresponsible and not give a fuck anymore. So the worst thing with that is like there are stories of that of like obviously rich kids just being irresponsible sure. and, and running up debts and not paying them off. So that's that's unfortunate. That is a red flag when you hear that one. It's different if it was like he'd made, you know, all this money from some insane business. But yeah, if you ever hear, because by the way, that's also the one in like Chinese esports. It's the nightmare. It's where like the owner is like, they're like, he's a billionaire. It's like, he is, but it's his dad who's the billionaire. So you never know on that one again. Right. When does he get his pocket money cut off as it were? When dad decides esports is no longer the investment. That's, exactly. That's the end of the org. <laughs> What happens now? Are they called unpaid? I mean, how, what do we think happens here? Does this organization stick around, Ted? I mean, you were there with them. Is is this them just sticking it out until they get someone else to sign them? Uh, the thing is, 
I think it's really difficult to say. I don't think the players themselves know whether they would stick around and play right. together. Obviously, I, I could tell that even though I think they played much better than a lot of people anticipated, it, it, it was obvious from the outside that Harn wasn't going to stay. It just felt like atmosphere, like they weren't on the same page. And I think there's obviously a CS explanation to it as well. If you want to go into in-game details, for example, you're looking at uh, two rifles on the team, Jacob and Cypher, that are incredibly needy in terms of space. And then you're looking at Harn, who's not a supportive Oper, which, for example, Nock used to do a lot easier. Cirque used to be a lot... Uh, a lot better at Harn is just not that type of a player, so I think it was never going to work with that lineup. I think from from the get go, probably they they had realized it. From here on out, I'm not really sure. That entire project was just complete chaos because you originally bench Nexa. They were trialing out a, a couple other guys. They were trialing out Patty, the the Danish in game leader that used to be on uh, on Australis Talon. They were trialing out a couple other Opers. Uh, then they stick with Harn. I think it's just really odd because I, I read that interview from Jacob. It was uh, he, he said that essentially everyone was just playing for their careers, right? But he himself said that they have no idea whether they were they were going to stick together because obviously if an organization comes knocking for that ready mix of guys with a with a GM, with an analyst, with a coach, it's a great deal, right? They're going to be able to find an Oprah. But what is the chance that an org just comes out of nowhere and it's like, hey guys, we're just going to pick you up now before? Uh, you know, before the major starts, I'd say it's a lot more probable that it would require a little bit of time, let's say one or two months, if they wanted to be an organization that is proper and can enter the circuit. What I will say, I would definitely say there's a couple of players in there that I could see play big Counter-Strike, but I'm not sure if the guys themselves could be really asked to hold on to all of that energy that was around that entire project because there's a lot of frustration that's going to get built up over time when you're not getting paid when the results are not great i mean you saw nog just left the first time he he got an opportunity and it's the right thing to do i think Nog just just made the right decision to go over to Fnatic. it's a it's a much better organization in terms of how they treat the players and he probably can get better results even though the Fnatic team is a little bit iffy but i just think they're going to stick around up until some individuals just get good enough offers, right? I If I wake up tomorrow and I see that Jacob got an, an offer from, I don't know, even Gamer Legion, I'm just throwing in a random name out there, even that type of a size of organization, I'm not going to be surprised if he just says, hey guys, you know what, I'm going to go there. Because it's a lot more secure, especially with the new circuit coming in from next year. I feel like for a lot of those players, this is going to be a factor. And one other thing is the fact that, again, Jacob said that in the interview, it's like, when you have an organization and you get paid month after month after month after month, we're talking about anyone but Jacob because obviously he's played professional CS for too long and he's all right financially, right? But for a lot of the other guys, this is the one thing that enables you to just be thinking only about the game sure. when you are getting paid. When there's boot camps, when there's tournaments, when everything is all right. And when, when you stop getting paid, then you got to start thinking about other things as well. And I feel like this is the one thing that could stop those guys to stick together and play without an organization because it, it could be really difficult to stay engaged and professional even though they have enough experience and as individuals they should be professional enough to know that this is the best chance that they could have as a team to stay together but still when you're not contracted then you're you're that size of a name like like jacob like nexus you're probably not going to find the same motivation to keep playing without an org i think for for example for vladen it is whatever, right? Because he's because he's just not getting too many opportunities. Sure. Although I believe he's actually a sick underrated player, by the way. I th I think he's he's cut to play tier one Counter Strike. But for for someone like Vladim, for someone like Cipher, even if they played without an org for a couple months, just to get the exposure and keep playing with those experienced guys, I think it would be fine. I don't think it's going to be the same amount of motivation and determination that Jacob and Nexa get if they just play without an org until the end of the year or at the start of twenty twenty five as well. How many opportunities are there going to be for for players like like the, the players we've mentioned for for these tier two teams coming next year? Because when you look at that calendar, it's so stacked with those S tier events. I think I think the first six months is literally it's like blast ESL PGL blast ESL PGL, the whole way through to the major. I mean, these there, there, there is such a vibrant tier two scene right now with paid teams, Ted? I mean, does that continue into next year or do you think that this whole open circuit might kill that? I don't know. Again, we're theorizing a little bit, but, but it's, it's 
Yeah, it is fun. There's it doesn't even count the online tournaments. That's the crazy part. Cause like people open HOTV, they look at the calendar, they're like the, the calendar is stacked. This is probably 30% of the events that are gonna happen next year as well. There's gonna be so much more going. I don't know. I I I guess there's gonna be more opportunities, but then in the same way, there's no way for us to know whether it's gonna be financially better for organizations. And in the end of the day, this is what it comes down to, right? The more I guess justifiable it is for organizations to enter Counter Strike. The more players are going to have teams, and the higher the salaries are going to be, and all of that stuff. So I guess we're going to have to wait a couple months to see. In terms of unpaid, I feel like a lot of the players, like some of the players, will probably land on solid teams. I, I think, especially with the with the lackluster form of a lot of the other tier two and, and tier three teams, maybe maybe even some tier one point five, right? Uh, but yeah, I, I I'm I'm not sure how to answer whether whether they're going to be able to land on uh, on their feet because again, there's just a lot of uncertainties going into 2025. I feel like we spoke a lot about the Cinderella stories right at the start, uh, Thorin and, and Saw was the the team that came up. And seeing as we're going through all the tier two tough times, this one for me was so interesting because it started and then there were all these things happening around it, and then the bleed story happened and the, the Saw one kind of got brushed under the carpet. But obviously. For anyone who has been living under a rock, you had saw they made this incredible run at IEM Cologne. and everyone was going on and on about how spectacular they were going to be. A lot of credit given to their coach. They go to ESL Challenger. They they didn't have a terrible performance. It wasn't great, but it wasn't terrible. It's two days later, their best player makes this announcement that he's leaving. He doesn't even have a team. Less than 24 hours later, the coach announces that he's out. The player's agent is tweeting about what a mess this organization is. You've got someone else from the organization posting about these problems. And suddenly, this entire story that everyone was so invested in and excited about has imploded right in front of us. Uh, and it's it's something that is common in, in these Tier 2 teams. Were you surprised? I mean, you weren't surprised, Thorin, because you said that you never think, thought that you would see Saw make one of those deep runs again. So... <laughs> You called it back then. I meant more because obviously I didn't think they were a good team. But no, in, in a <laughs> sense though, there is a logic to it, which is this is actually why I'm a little bit torn on the whole topic of the tier two scene next year and what the circuit's going to be like. Because put it this way, I'm an elitist. Like I don't really need to care about how like bleeding sword does financially as long as G2 Vitality phase that are all legit because I'm only trying to watch the top 10 teams play each other. So the joke is, by the way, I'm not even arguing on my behalf. Like I want all the tournaments to be like the top 20 teams. And I don't really give a monkeys if someone else sneaks in there. Like if anything, I could even and argue now look sadly this isn't the case if the actual tier two and tier three scenes were also really sturdy eventually all the best ones would break into the top 23 etc and then get their spot wouldn't they the problem is though by the way that's a bigger issue in itself that's why people when they thought there was going to be all the open qualifiers didn't get what they wanted because actually when you get locked into tier two and you have to get out by only being the number one tier it's the hardest probably thing to be the best at in the world like I'm not even joking you could literally take a top five team now and make them play every CCT and I guarantee you they wouldn't even win half like that's mm. how hard tier two online CS is. Like it's, I don't think you can win it as consistently as you can tier one land CS in a stadium. It's why the joke is we actually can do ridiculous predictions where we predict like phase to win a game. They shouldn't, if it's on a stadium, uh, a clone in a way that you can't, even if I take team 13 in the world and have them play team 70 in an online game, but there just isn't the same intangibles in that match, unfortunately. So I think the bigger issue for me is this sort of shows what I'm seeing before. Like I don't actually personally know if short saw the org is shady. I would imagine they're just quite small and so actually I would say by the way some things just go hand in hand but like again maybe sometimes your sponsors pay late or maybe your sponsor looks like the same or sponsor as a tier one org but yours in this case maybe comes through the Portugal branch and so your actual sponsorship's a tenth of what that you know phase clan would be or vitality if they have a similar sponsor so I would say some of these can just be teething problems of being in like newer teams or smaller teams but I also think the downside here is this is where I think the sinister part is it's the fact that it doesn't seem like as you say that the player leaving who's the most eligible player basically to join another team it doesn't seem like he's leaving because he has another spot and this isn't even like a reprisal it just seems like he's realized this is basically the one chance i have to get out of here now while i've got a name and so in doing so he's had to basically say i'm just gonna have to give everything up and then the coach one looks really sus because as you say a lot of people actually credit the coach as to why they sort of 
went over the top before, they would always like come this close to getting an upset and then not do it, even at the lands, etc. Whereas actually they were getting those wins. So I think a lot of people credited he must have had a minimum cultural impact, if not directly. If you ever watch his, he actually streams, if people don't know, doing his homework, probably actual tactical insight into how to play the game. So what it implies to me is one, people who have potentially value elsewhere realize this is the time to get out, basically. And then two, this is where I don't actually know what people were trying to infer because I, to me, it seems like the way those public posts were all made, even by the players getting bent and kicked almost made it seem like they were almost implying there was something dodgy going on behind the scenes. Sure. Like, who knows? Maybe people are trying to lock you in, or maybe people are doing that thing, which is the other downside of tier two, which is cause if you are a player by the who's very eligible like that, who just had a great performance. If you were to actually get signed while under contract, the, you could obviously have a massive buyout, it could be a six figure buyout where they could benefit. So suddenly you have that whole thing of do they want to sit on that and then charge someone the highest price and then we get back into that thing we've seen in the Brazilian the Russian scenes a lot which is sometimes teams do that too much and they're sort of like look unless you pay an insane buyout I just keep him but then I don't even really benefit just from keeping him and they don't do a proper business deal where you sort of meet in the middle and every party gets something they want so the Saw one's quite interesting because I would say that is the Bleed one to me is one of those like very rare ones that comes along where they were trying to play at such high sticks if anything by the way there's another reason why Kassad I think did a very good job in that team I've heard behind the scenes he was also given the green light to go and sign like enormous players and he was smart enough to tell him don't do that like we need to build up slowly imagine by the way the situation he'd been if he'd done that if you know, actually had some player like they had in games like Valorant people who could potentially be like seven figure a player year salary type people like that would be bonkers to them not pay those people and the drama would have been ten times worse the sole one to me seems a bit more run of the mill it just which is obviously a straight fire pun there if you think about it but whatever so because to me they are just a smaller org aren't they they're one of those ones that's been around for a long long time but they've never been a giant org and in fact this is actually basically the first time I've seen one of their teams sort of have a chance to do something big in the game and apparently it's already fallen apart unfortunately yeah i think it's really unfortunate as well uh first of all just just the thing that you said about the bleed just imagine if they had gotten for example a leash and that would have been crazy crazy. uh about so i think there's a more there's a much more because i don't know too much about the organization as well but i think there's a much more explicable version of it it, that is connected to the in-game counter-strike uh part of it I, i feel like with barry because at least to me, like Barry is a is a great coach. Like he's, I, I followed his work probably since 2021 on when he was still on Sprout. Obviously, he spent like three years on Sprout or so. Uh, Barry's always been really good at working with young guys, always getting the best out of his players. And as you pointed out, even during the streams, you can tell that strategically, like tactically, he's a really sound guy. So I think he goes to the team. It was obvious that the energy was good. It was obvious that you know he elevated the team. I think it's just as simple as it's really difficult to justify having an English speaking coach in a team where everyone wants to speak Portuguese. I think uh, at, at least to me, that feels like a deal breaker in the long term, right? Short term, it could work out. But if you want to stay there for a longer period of time, he can't understand the comms when they're playing inside uh, inside of the server and officials, for example, if uh, I don't know, the communication is a little bit off. He can't really tell while the game is going, right? Because he can't understand. He can only look at the game and then give them uh, input in English. So I feel like in, in general, it's just really complicated to be an English speaking coach and a team that's just speaking one language that is not English and you don't understand. Uh, at least to me, that feels like the only logical move or he got better offers, but apparently he didn't because he said that he didn't know what he wanted to do for the remaining of the season. And then he went on and signed with nine, right? So I, I, I would say that for me, this is probably the, I don't know, logical version that I'm willing to accept. And in terms of arrows, those I, I think again with Saw, it's I don't want to say they're one-dimensional. I actually think their their strat book, especially since Barry got at it, was really deep for for a tier two team. But at times, the Counter Strike that they play could be considered a little bit inhibiting. I think is the right way to put it. And if you're an arrows, those you're playing great Counter Strike. You you're a really hot prospect that everyone's talking about you feel like as you as you said i think you made a really good point you feel like this is your chance to break through the mold right let's say they offered him a new contract that had a massive buyout and he was like well i know a lot of guys would get me on their team right now because i'm playing really good counter-strike but maybe if i if i sign that contract then if, if they have to pay six figures or whatever they just would go for someone that's a little bit cheaper and i don't want to stay with those guys because let's say we have different policies for how the game is supposed to be played i want a little bit more freedom and i'm not getting that freedom i'm playing 
anchor lurking positions being a little bit supportive and still putting on those numbers what happens if i start playing star positions but they wouldn't let me play star positions in that team because that would mess up with the system so that could be an argument as well to why he wanted to uh get benched and get out of the team because i remember i saw a tweet from one of the other players saying that they understand arrows those his decision they just don't approve of the way that it was made so i would say that at least to me it looks like he spent a little bit of time trying to you know get his opinion to be a little bit more heard on how he wanted to play the game and then when he said when when he realized that things were not going to work out he was just like okay i'm leaving okay let me put my jake lackey hat on for a minute and just create a bunch of drama here that's probably not true uh so don't you find it funny jens that a week before this whole thing happens, Arasta signs with an agent. He's since come out and said he was in a negotiation and he felt he needed someone to represent him. So he signs with this agent. You've got the RMRs coming up. You've just done this deep run at Cologne. Your stocks are super high as a team. You sign with this agent a day after Atlanta. You've played this tournament, you're out. Okay, the, the announcement comes, you say, listen, I, I don't know what happened, I'm out, I don't even have a team, this is where we're sitting. That seems really weird. So it's not your, I, I would take, that's not your choice to leave because you're looking for a team, you had an opportunity to play in the RMRs. 24 hours later, the coach is leaving and the coach is signed to the same agency as the player. Anyone else not smelling? I feel like something is going on here that no one's talking about. And I did, damn it, I want to know. Because I mean, put it this way. One angle, obviously, is the problem is this isn't simple trying to get a team. If simple wants an agent, yeah, of course, they're going to instantly represent him because they're going to get him a team. But I would say I agree with you, Sam. Put it this way. The fact that you even signed with the agent, to me, when you're as small as this person is, implies he's already got a few deals or a few people lined up. And he's sort of saying, once you sign with me, then I can then approach these people. And, you know, let's say I might have heard something because Remember, that is also a way to get around any kind of like poaching things, etc. Like, you're going you know, to make it, it's not the team themselves approaching you. They've just spoken to him and he happens to maybe, he think you know, what you do is you go, I think you're in a really bright future in this industry. You know, I could see you mm. in a lot of different places and environments. And like, I, I, I think there's probably something to that side, especially because, as you say, both people signed to the same agent. Really, bro. Really. That's the crazy part. Is the crazy part that he benches himself before the RMR. I would yeah, understand course. if he waited to play sure. the RMR. And, and, and that, that's why, through my perspective, it's like, okay, there must be some some kind of enormous bad It makes it sound like he's going to end up hands. on a team that's in the RMR, Ted. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, exactly. It's like, you're either getting picked up by a team that's playing yes. the RMR in the major, yes. or you just can't breathe the same air yes. with anyone on the team, right? I just like this because Richard, I watch, I still keep referring back to this video where Richard Lewis said we need to stop like trading in the drama of Counter-Strike. No, Richard, it's all <laughs> okay. we want to talk about. I love the drama. That's what's interesting. I, I think more will come from this, but like to, to get back to the whole conversation in terms of like the, the tier two chaos that we're talking about, like Thorin said, I mean, Ted, the, the ugly truth is for most fans and trolls watching, they don't really care what happens in tier two. They just want to watch G2 play against Vitality. They, that's what they want yeah. to see, right? So, so does it allow all this crazy shit to, to go on? Does it just keep going on? Is that kind of what makes tier two so fun? I think... Obviously, it is a bit of a charm to it, right? Because it's kind of like you, you're you playing career mode on FIFA and there's all those random shit transfers happening all the time. And you play two seasons and then instantly Ronaldo's playing on, I don't know, Bournemouth or whatever. Uh, so it's really difficult to predict. So I think that makes it interesting. The one thing that I, I don't think a lot of people appreciate enough and realize is that Tier 2, th there's some teams that play proper Counter-Strike in Tier 2. Like, there's a lot of Tier 1 teams stealing things away from Tier 2 teams, right? You're looking at... I, I can give a couple of examples. Let's say Sango, for example, on Nuke, on Anubis, are coming up with their own things. Fnatic, who I'm not counting as a Tier 1 team now, <laughs> al although they have Tier 1 players, are coming up with their own things. For example, Banana Takes are really unique. So I, I think Tier 2 has its own charm. It's obviously going to be a lot more different to Tier 1, and people are not going to be as interested. And if there wasn't gambling, Tier 2 Counter-Strike probably wouldn't even be on the map. But uh, yeah, I mean, obviously the fact that not a lot of people pay attention to it allows some shithousery to happen without really proper punishment and without people giving it enough attention because it's kind of like you're used to it, right? You're used to some organizations uh, just disappearing, not paying players, some tournaments not paying players and stuff like that. Thankfully, especially in terms of the tournaments, there's a lot of tier two TOs nowadays, like Elisa, like Relog, that will always pay in time and are going to be proper towards every single team. But uh, th th there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of uncertainties there. But yeah, I mean, in terms of the 
unpredictable roster changes and you know a coach joins he leaves one month later uh then the things that for example happened between aurora and nine pandas where they trade clax and result all of that thing is it, just incredibly entertaining i think like obviously it's not how business is supposed to be done but at the end of the day it's fun like you're uh, as you said sam you're just following the drama you're just open twitter and you're like oh there's a, a 20 reply tweet longer let me see what happened there and it's just it, it just helps you to build storylines as well when you're on broadcast and when you're watching i think this is the one thing that could actually make tier two counter strike really enjoyable to watch if you're a fan that's not really interested in let's see let's say seeing what type of a meta double molly uh mid anubis take sango have been able to develop you're just like well i saw that this guy told that guy to fuck off on that social media so i'm just gonna watch the game and see them play against each other this is exactly what richard lewis doesn't want that's what he was trying to say uh so i'm interested thorn because you you brought this up earlier about uh, elisa being smaller next year or whatever but there's also this other side of it do you think that with the open circuit, it does create a space for a lot of these tier two tournament organizers to do some cool shit. Because, I mean, that was the thing with Elisa, right? They put together the dream desk, the one everyone wanted to see. They were brave enough to put it on. And while the teams were in tier one, because you had this incredibly entertaining desk, you had so many people tuning in. There were people that wanted eyeballs on this because it was super entertaining. And Therefore, they put eyeballs on those teams, which is ultimately what everyone's trying to do. Do you think that there's space next year with an open circuit for more tournament organizers to to be a little bit brave and do some different stuff like that? Or will the three big ones with all their money continue to dominate? The problem, as always, is whether or not people have the right mindset. Because I feel like in esports, it's often something people say behind the scenes. They say it's an industry of followers. Like, basically, what people do, fully if it's the same in the game, by the way, people just look at whoever the best is. So when ESL was perceived to be the best, everyone looks and basically just tries to be like a worse version of ESL because they're not being themselves. They're trying to be ESL. By the way, you can make the exact same analogy about pro players. If people don't know, when you look back at the dominant era of Astralis, like 2018 onwards, I would say one of the number one mistakes their rivals made was trying to play the same way and they were just a worse version. Like, I actually think Team Liquid literally did that in 2018 and as a result, we're on the same maps trying to be a slightly worse version of Astralis and that's why they were like the only team that couldn't beat Astralis. So I would say... Any time in life you're not the top dog, you probably shouldn't play the meta. You shouldn't play like the best strategy. You should find a unique strategy to yourself. So I would say you could, some teams I do think, not just on the talent side, Sam, that's an obvious angle you could do, but I also do think that's actually where if you're the tier two tournament, I think you are incentivized to be creative is why not make, for example, your um, format completely different from someone else's. Like, for example, I'll tell you right now, there's not a lot of people doing like double limb tournaments, for example. Maybe yours is like a big double elimination bracket, like the old days or maybe I've, I've given this example in the past but no one ever bloody listens for some reason I always say if I was a, a tournament organiser I would either get what I think is the best map at the time or when a new map gets released I'd do a custom tournament for that one map like imagine if you had I'll give you the example right now Ted imagine if you had a tournament for all the best tier 2 teams who can't get into these massive you know 1 million dollar tournaments and it's yeah. like an ancient only tournament Every match is be your one in the big bracket, and it's all the best ancient teams for. Mean, so it's that's like, like Mongols our, our against... open qualifiers, though, right? Everyone just plays this. <laughs> no, but I mean, the point is, if you went in with that as yeah, like yeah. the express theme, you'd get a really interesting tournament. And all of a sudden, you'd find yeah. some teams like way yeah. deeper on that map, and you realize you'd actually find like all the new gimmicks. By the way, I'm sure just like just just the interest. By the way, I guarantee some tier one teams would watch that tournament and see did anything interesting come out of it. So things like that that kind of have a unique aspect. So again, you're not making your tier tournament just a worse version of a big tier tournament ones without the top team. So sure. I do think there are ways you could pivot. By the way, actually, the obvious angle of this Halop one is an obvious way you could do it as well, because that is where, if you think of CS, CS Summit and Beyond the Summit and the Home Story Cups, they didn't. They typically were almost never closest to the biggest tournaments. You watch those again for the different vibe, the atmosphere. In the particular case of those tournaments, they would integrate players into the broadcast in a way you don't get on a traditional broadcast. So I do think if that's it, the area where, if there really is no way to get in the top teams and the circuit becomes a bit cynical, I would say that is the obvious angle you can actually like be creative because in this particular case you obviously can't do much about inviting the teams as the one part maybe you handcuffed a bit yeah i agree i think it's a bit of a handicap as well but it's a blessing in disguise almost for for tier two uh, tournament organizers because as you pointed out it actually gives them a lot more freedom to be creative sure. in a way and it gives a lot more freedom to the broadcast talent as well to be creative like if you're not getting hired for the big lan events and tier ones and stuff like that and you get hired to do a couple smaller lans then you can go to those guys and be like, hey guys, I have that idea that I want to pitch you. And I think because of my idea, a lot of more people are going to be watching the event, right? Especially when you're not going to have some of the bigger teams because there's 
just going to be tier one tournaments all over the year. So yes. you're not even going to be able to get that cheeky, let's say one or two top 15 or top 10 teams to participate in your LAN event. So yeah, I mean, it, it is a good way in a certain, in, in, it is a good thing in a certain way because you do get a lot more freedom to operate. But then in the same in the same time, as you pointed out, it's a lot easier to just feel like you're creating a, a, a the same version of a tier one tournament, but with just lesser quality, which is not really what you want to be doing, especially when there's you know, competing tier one tournaments going simultaneously with your event. You want to be able to stand out with something. By the way, I'd even say, I think the underrated angle, I think, is... You, I don't mean this in case of, like, high me, like, Richard losing that. I still think the thing people miss is, why not also have, like, a throwback event? Like, by the way, some of these casters are still out there. Put together an old casting duo or something, or have, like, DDK or Bardolf come back for one event or something. Like, again, things that just have a novelty value, I think, are worth giving a go. I feel like this isn't actually even just a tier two tournament organizer advice list. This actually sure. is going to have to be everyone's because yeah. next yeah. year you are going to be everyone working is going to be competing for eyeballs. And there is like, let's, let's be completely honest. Yeah. We all love Counter-Strike, but can you guarantee that you are going to be watching CS every single day for the next six months? Cause that is literally what the calendar I mean, looks like right now. Sure. People are going to get so fatigued. So unless you're coming up with like some really cool shit to keep viewers entertained, I, that's why I kind of like the, the blast bounty system. It's something different and fun. But if you're not bringing that into the mix and we're all just doing the straight standard desk of like, here's the desk, let's introduce the game, we go to game, we come back, we do some analysis, here's a fun play, or if we go to the next game, people are going to lose viewers so quick and then ultimately the money is going to drain out. So it is going to have to be the year of, of creative thinking, I think, from a, a broadcast perspective without a doubt, Ted. Yeah, I think ESL are already in a way preparing for that thing with the last couple of seasons that they did with the goofy, you know, type of style. But I agree with you. I mean, it's a really niche thing if you're just keeping it the same, but just different talks about, you know, the strats and the storylines and going into the matchups. Like, this is going to be interesting to just a, a few people, right? And as you said yourself, I mean, even when you're working in the industry, if you're watching Counter-Strike every single day for eight hours for six months, you're eventually going to get sick and tired of it, right? Uh, even though, for example, I'm one of the few people that really enjoys watching the entire analyst segments and desk segments, and especially when, you know, analysts get nerdy and all of that. But this is a really niche thing. Like, sure. most people don't really enjoy listening to that. And like, like, let's say everyone on Twitch chat or on Twitter is going to say, we want more in-game analysis or in-depth talk and stuff like that. And then they bring someone to give them that analysis. And they're like, well, this guy is boring. Bring me Maui to tell me that Nafani is shit. So it's like... A I mean, you got to be entertaining. You can still bring in some quality, but you can't just go with the vanilla, yeah, we're going to pretend that we are, uh, you know, football commentator studios from 10 years ago. Because even football commentator studios nowadays are really good. Like if, you, if you're like, if we got to make a reference to, let's say, Sky Sports, for example, because I'm obviously the majority of the football games I watch are with Bulgarian commentary. But the, the funny reels and clips that I see from, uh, you know, Mika Richards and Thierry Henry and Gate and, and all that, it's just pure entertainment. They're barely talking about proper football right so i guess it's not even something that we we need to as an industry come up with as a new prospect uh, no, as no. a new idea we just need to look on other fields and be like well you know what this looks cool we are in esports so we can actually make it even more goofy than that let's take that send it through our unique lens or just reform it in a way and then give it to the audience and see what happens but yeah you're you're gonna pretty much have to be extremely creative next year if you want to be competitive for people to prefer your product over others i haven't been very creative for this episode i just fell back on drama because i've been in transit for 23 hours to get to this hotel room so i do apologize for that but gents thank you for chatting for, for us taking a look at the the tier two tough times and i'd love to hear from the comments what you think we covered a lot of stuff yeah so just jump into whatever it is or you can join the other random commenter from a recent youtube video who said i should just stop speaking uh, and you can add your right. voice to him okay. as well thanks so much for watching we'll see you soon